Paul wanted to be famous. He didn't care how. Fortunately, he had a vehicle. He brought excitement. There are people like that. There is a charisma, terrific charisma he had. There are several approaches to the jungle. My wife and I tried them all. But we found being dropped from a plane the most satisfactory. <laughs> he was one of those real Pagliacci's whose comedy came out of some of his discomfort. Seems there's been a slight mistake. <laughs> Underneath all that humor always was a little bit of cruelty. He was hilariously funny on one drink. On two drinks, he was Joseph Mengele. When I think of you as a blood relative, I long for a transfusion. <laughs> I loved most about him this marvelous humor that no one else had. It was a joy. All in in the Hollywood Square. Mount Vernon, Ohio, a small town in the heart of the Midwest with a population of no more than 15,000. Known as the birthplace of Daniel Decatur Emmett, the composer who wrote Dixie and Old Dan Tucker, now it's also known as the birthplace of Paul Lind. Paul Lind was born in Mount Vernon on June 13, 1926. His father, Hoy Lind, served four years as county sheriff. And when Paul was small, the family lived over the county jail. When Paul's father wasn't sheriff, he was a butcher, a butcher with a sense of humor. Saturday mornings at the butcher shop, when someone would order a rump roast, Hoy Lynn would go into his act. He would take his arm and lay Shorty, another butcher, across the butcher block, grab a saw, and start sewing on his rump. And that would bring the house down. Paul's mother, Sylvia, was a quiet woman who doted on her children and loved to cook. Starches and fried food were her favorite menu items, and eating was the central activity of the house. They used to joke that in his family at lunch, they would always talk about what they were going to have for dinner. That was just the food was such an important part of their whole family dynamic. Paul was the fifth of six children and the third of four boys. Right from the start, Paul felt worthless. There was four brothers. And he always listed him as um, Richard the Athlete, Cordy the Brain, Johnny the Baby, and Paul the Nothing. He really felt like he was just kind of lost in his huge family. Paul may have felt that way about himself, but no one else did. His friends thought he was intelligent and entertaining. In the early years, he was smart, articulate, and very funny. When Paul was 10, his appendix ruptured. This was followed by an illness called peritonitis, and Paul was bedridden for nearly a year. During this time, his mother lavished him with her Midwestern cooking, and Paul gained over 100 pounds. When he entered high school, he weighed 260 pounds. In later years, he would say he looked like Kate Smith's niece. He worried about his weight, apparently, all the time in high school. And he told me that when he was playing in the school band, the uniform wouldn't fit him because he was a big kid. And he played the bass drum in the band because he could put it over his uniform and they wouldn't see that it didn't fit. He just became the proverbial fat kid of his class. And uh, in order to uh, compensate for that and find his own identity, he just became the, the fat clown of the class. He, he knew that he could use his weight for laughs. Paul fostered his comedy style with his friends, a gang of kids on the fringes of the class who entertained themselves with sadistic satire, as Lynn described it, and pranks such as selling family furniture when their parents were out of town. One of the members of this gang was a girl named Marilyn. Paul considered her his girlfriend, but he liked her more than I think than, than she liked him. We always had good times together. Paul and his friends went to the movies a lot. Paul himself often spent entire Saturdays in the theater. He was actually obsessed with movies. He really wanted just to be rich and famous, and he thought the only way he could do it was to become a movie star. Paul was so obsessed with wealth that as a kid, he would sit on the steps of a mansion near his house and wave at passing cars, pretending he lived there. Paul took his passion for movies and acting to school, where he performed in a number of school plays. And that opportunity came to go out on that stage. He loved it. You could just see that it's, 
it was part of his makeup. Oh, he was a good actor, but not in the leading roles. And I think that was good goes back to the weight problem. After school, Paul worked in his father's butcher shop. He hated washing out the chicken coop and cleaning the chickens, but he enjoyed working Saturday mornings when all the meat orders were called in and he could joke with the customers. He had little respect, however, for his father's chosen profession. He was embarrassed that his father was a butcher. He would like to have his occupation more elevated, so he always referred to him as a cattle surgeon. He felt that that came across a, a notch or two higher. Paul was not a great student, but a speech teacher at his high school was impressed with his writing and acting ability. She encouraged him to apply to her alma mater, Northwestern University's Speech and Drama School. Paul's father disapproved. He didn't want his son to go into show business. But Paul enrolled there anyway in the fall of 1944, and his father came through with the tuition. We were both 17 and freshmen at Northwestern at speech school. And of course, it's such a large school that we didn't meet right away. And finally, a young fellow came to me and said, is your name Lind? And I said, no. And he said, well, there's a fellow here who looks just like you. I said, oh, OK. About a week later, this marvelous kind of fattish fellow came up and looked at me and said, so you're the one. <laughs> and I knew it was Paul Lind. We both have kind of lots of teeth and sad green eyes. Paul soon became part of a close circle of friends, some of whom remained friends for life. And Paul stood out right from the start with one of his first assignments. When you start Northwestern, you take introduction to oral interpretation with Dr. Charlotte Lee. And this 17-year-old, Mount Vernon, Ohio, he gets up and starts out with this, forgive me for being out of breath, but I just spoke in a high school on the other side of town. And speaking in three high schools in one day does win the fellow. And then he took off from there. You know, speaking of three or four different high schools in one evening does win the fellow. But I'd be willing to give my last breath if I thought I could impress upon you the importance of my subject. Now, I don't suppose there's a kid in this room that doesn't know I'm speaking on sexual relations <laughs> and has come with the idea of getting a kick out of what I'm going to say. <laughs> well, I want those smart alecks to leave right now. Dr. Lee was catatonic. She just, <laughs> she thought, what is this? Well, by then the, the class was screaming with laughter, and so was she. She couldn't believe it. This was his introduction to oral interp. He did this long monologue as this employee from the, from the state health agency. And his fame spread fast. He was born finished. I don't think he uh, needed to learn anything. He had this specific individual, unique personality and a way of speaking, way of delivering a line, canted sense of humor, point of view. And it was contagious. You wanted to be with Paul. You wanted to be around Paul. Paul claimed that he was intent on becoming a serious dramatic actor, but not everyone believed it. Already, he was developing his signature style. I don't think he was ever really that serious about being a serious actor. I saw him do an acting class, a scene once with Macbeth, and he was doing it very, very well, and then he just couldn't stand it any longer, and he just had to do a side look as Paul would do with that mouth and did one of the lines as Paul Lind would do it, and of course destroyed the whole scene, and from then on out it was just people screaming with laughter. But that was done on purpose. Paul would try and do serious parts, but he just opened his mouth and everyone would fall to the floor. He couldn't, couldn't make them be serious. If he wasn't really serious about becoming a dramatic actor, he was still very serious about something else. He would say in our early morning speech class, he'd look over to me and say, I'm going to be rich and famous. 
And we all said, sure, okay. <laughs> Paul would not be the only one from that class to become rich and famous. Among his schoolmates those years were Charlotte Ray, Patricia Neal, and Charlton Heston, to name a few. And it was a crowd that knew they were going somewhere. No doubt. We were the cream of the crop. I mean, we were. It, it, it's not bragging. It's the truth. It's just, uh, we weren't hopefuls. During his years at Northwestern, Paul performed in many shows and plays. He was very popular with other students, although he formed no serious relationships. It was a pattern he'd follow for years. He had no emotional attachments in school with anybody. He had very, very close friends, very dear friends. But there was a shield around him, um, and no one could break through that shield. Paul did continue to speak of a girlfriend back home, but no one ever met her, and he dated no other women. His closest friends soon figured out he was gay. But it was the kind of thing you didn't talk about. And the reason were, in those days, the answer was very simple. You'd go to jail, um, get kicked out of the university. It wasn't worth it. In 1948, Paul Lind graduated, barely, from Northwestern, carrying with him the honor of being named Best Actor of the Year. Now, he was ready to take on New York. Paul Lind graduated from Northwestern in 1948 and immediately set out for New York, ready to take Broadway by storm. And he already had somewhat of a head start. A young Broadway actress had seen him perform in one of his college shows. I went there and I was astounded at how professional it was and how good it was. And I said, my God, they're so talented. But Paul was exceptional. I mean, he was so hilarious. He was just wonderful, and I said, that guy is truly going to be a star. Cape armed him with a number of introductions to theatrical agents and producers. He started to make the rounds of production offices and auditions, and his father continued to send money from home. Paul's first year in New York was what he called his playboy period because he was living off the funds of his father and not really pushing himself to look for jobs because he had this money coming in. But in February of 1949, the roof caved in, both financially and emotionally. Paul's beloved brother Corridon, a soldier who had been reported missing in action since the Battle of the Bulge in 1944, was officially pronounced dead. Then Paul's mother died a few weeks later of heart failure, reportedly from the shock of the news. Three months after that, Cordy's body was shipped home for burial, and the day after the funeral, Paul's father died, also from heart failure. Over a few months' time, Paul was left parentless and penniless. When his father died, he came back to New York after the funeral, and he lived in some very inexpensive boarding house where Imogene Coca and Marlon Brando also had uh, roomed at the same time. He would steal food from their uh, refrigerator, uh, their community refrigerator. He always talked about this as the lowest point in his life. Paul could not find any acting work, so he took odd jobs as a waiter and hotel clerk to make ends meet. He also sold his blood every six weeks for $5 a pint. On top of all this, Paul received news that his high school friend Marilyn was marrying someone else. He used her the rest of his life as a beard. Whenever anybody would ask, why, why weren't you married, or why haven't you married, he would always say that, this Marilyn from his childhood broke his heart. The only positive thing to come out of this period is that Paul set his mind to losing weight. He realized he was not getting roles because of his appearance. So over the course of two years, he lost almost 100 pounds. The first time I saw him after college, about two and a half years later, I was blown away. I barely recognized him. He was a very handsome guy. But this would not mark the end of Lynn's battles with weight. Paul had to struggle with diets for the rest of his life to keep himself trim. Paul, Lynn, and I have gained and lost 2,000 pounds in our lifetime. Frightening. I hate people that can eat anything they want. And he did too. We'd go to a restaurant and say, look at her. Look at her stuffing her face. Well, you know, it, it was frightening. On Thanksgiving Day, 1950, Paul's fortunes changed. He wrote some funny material, entered an amateur stand-up comic contest at a popular New York night spot, and won. 
For the prize, he got a one-week engagement at the club. This, in turn, led to a series of other nightclub dates. A year later, he got a big break when he snagged a spot in a Broadway review, New Faces of 1952, which was later made into a film. There, he performed his now classic monologue, The Trip of the Month Club, where he played a hapless but determinedly upbeat survivor of a horrific tourist trip to Africa. The next morning was one of those mornings when you hear the screech of the orangutan, the roar of the lion, and the trees were full of beautifully colored birds and snakes. Rembrandt couldn't have captured that beauty. It was one of those mornings you feel like just running around barefoot. Well, we had only been tramping on the trail about four or five hours, and my wife began to complain of her feet. The only shoes she had with her were those high old sling pumps. <laughs> well, she just couldn't take it, so we had to leave her there out on the trail. A couple of days later, on the way back, I found this piece of her dress, along with her purse and gloves, and to this day, I don't know what happened to her. <laughs> Other performers in the show included Eartha Kitt, Carol Lawrence, and Alice Ghostly. New Faces became a huge Broadway hit, and Lynn's performance was singled out as the funniest bit of the evening. In another skit, Lynn was an unreformed pickpocket. His manic, exaggerated style was becoming his trademark. Hey, something's happening to me. I'm getting so I can't pick pockets when cops are around. I was never like that, wasn't I? No, Harry, you were never like that. Tell me I was never like that. You were never like that, Harry. I was never like that. You were never. I was never like that. It looked like Lind was well on his way, but it would be a long time before he saw Broadway again. Over the next eight years, he made guest appearances on variety shows and did some radio work and summer stock theater. He also went back to his old eating habits and ballooned accordingly. By 1958, Paul was in a deep depression and not working at all. He said he was contemplating suicide. He talked about around that time that he was at this party with a bunch of his friends in New York and he just stood up halfway through the party and said, you know, I haven't heard a word anyone said all night and I just don't think it's fair to be doing this to you. And he like left the party and the very next day he decided he had to get some analysis. Paul saw a psychiatrist for more than a year. He later claimed she saved his life. Paul's career also took a huge leap forward. In 1960, Director Gower Champion hired him to play the father of a star-struck teenager in the new Broadway musical, Bye Bye Birdie. Paul would play the same role in the successful movie version of the show three years later. I demand respect around here. It's my hair! Respect, to hair, respect! I respect you, Papa. I don't want your respect. Who wants respect from a 10-year-old kid? The part was made for Paul Lynn. Nobody else played that guy. He played just kind of a common man who looked aghast at the world around him and, and couldn't deal with it. He just was totally helpless at all times and was, and was very cranky about it. Bye Bye Birdie became a huge hit on Broadway and established Paul as a major comic star. It was so exciting and he invited me to the premiere and I had such a marvelous time. We walked into Sardi's afterwards and everyone clapped for Paul. It was such a fine evening. I'll never forget it. For the film, only Paul and Dick Van Dyke were hired from the original Broadway cast. But Paul was not at all pleased with the Hollywood version of Bye Bye Birdie. He said it should have been called Hello Ann Margaret. At the opening of the film, she comes out and she sings the title song, Bye Bye Birdie. And then at the tail end, they have her doing that again, so she's the last thing you remember when you go out of the theater. But that was not in the original cut of it at all. That was added later. So it became kind of an Anne Margaret movie, although everybody certainly did do well with it, including Paul. But I don't think Paul was quite the success in the movie that he had been on the stage, because part of that, uh, that salty humor that he had was diluted somewhat in the film. But Paul had bigger problems on his hands during the filming of Bye Bye Birdie than Anne Margaret's high visibility. A longtime fondness for drinking was turning into full-fledged alcoholism. One thing that we shared uh, at the time uh, 
we talked about it many, many years later. In those days, particularly during the movie, which was about 1963 or 4, we were both sliding into alcohol addiction and were not aware of it, as people seldom are when it's happening to them. And Paul was beginning a self-destructive pattern of turning vicious when he got drunk. There is a story that happened during Bye Bye Birdie that was only funny to me now. He wanted to meet Hal Prince, the Broadway producer. He idolized him, thought he was a genius. And one, a woman that we knew was having a party. And Hal Prince was coming, and he pleaded with her, please, let me come to your party so I can meet Hal Prince. So she did. And uh, she, he met Hal Prince and immediately backed him against the wall and cut him to ribbons. I mean, just absolutely slashed him to pieces. He had gone over the, the hump there with his drinking and became his nasty self. Well, the next day, he was beside himself. He said, oh, my idol, my idol, I love that man. I, I just tore him to pieces. So he called this woman and once again pleaded, please, I have got to make amends. You've got to let me make up to this man. So she did, had him back, and he did the same thing again. He did back him against the wall. And so he's, he couldn't help himself. <laughs> it's too bad that Hal Prince did not have a sense of humor about it, and I understand that he didn't. With the success of Bye Bye Birdie, Lynn decided to make a permanent move to Los Angeles. He was done with the theater world for now, and he was ready to see what Hollywood and television had to offer. By the time Paul Lind was 36, he was well on his way to becoming a celebrity. His star turn in Bye Bye Birdie led to the recording of a comedy album and regular spots on shows like The Perry Como Show. Over the next few years, he appeared in minor roles in films like Under the Yum Yum Tree and Beach Blanket Bingo. His role in The Glass Bottom Boat was significant, if only because it was his first and only film appearance in drag. May I, may I have this dance? Uh, oh, oh, officer. Would you like? I've been watching you all evening. You've been acting very suspiciously, especially around the buffet table. Uh, the buffet table. Uh, and you haven't taken a bite. I do. Well, I've been, you know. <laughs> it was a funny scene. I think it also illustrates, though, how limited Paul actually was as a performer. And one reason, perhaps, why he didn't do better films and wasn't embraced by better directors is because he did the same thing over and over again. Lind continued to make guest appearances on variety shows throughout the 60s. He also guest starred in many television series, both dramas and sitcoms, although his roles were always comedic, never serious. People didn't want that. They wanted the comedy. I mean, that was his thing. I, I think he could have done individual parts that were serious. He had that depth, but he never, he didn't have the opportunity. Instead, Paul was forging a lucrative career as a character actor, most notably on series like The Monsters, I Dream of Jeannie, and Bewitched. He was originally hired on Bewitched to play Samantha's driving instructor. Would you like to join me in a cup of coffee? Do you think we can both fit? <laughs> Ready? Ready. How am I doing? How to phrase it tactfully. You are rotten. <laughs> Elizabeth Montgomery enjoyed Paul so much that the show created the regular role of Uncle Arthur for him. My life has no meaning. I have loved and lost. Oh, my stars. <laughs> A broken-hearted clown. <laughs> Laugh, clown. No one knows your heart is broken. Even though you're only make believing laugh, cloud laugh. He was great in that because that was also a level that was good for him. I mean, it was not an important series. It was a entertaining series. It was very lightweight and all of that. And it was, again, something that he could kind of do, I think, with his eyes closed. Director William Asher and his wife, Elizabeth Montgomery, became Paul's best friends. 
and he spent an enormous amount of time with them. But Paul still found it hard to be close to very many people. For the most part, he remained aloof. His persona on camera and on stage was totally different. He actually was very introverted, very, very shy uh, around people. He had a very close-knit group of friends, but that was about it. And Paul's drinking problem was getting worse. After a few cocktails, that genial, funny guy that people saw on television lost all control and became very mean, sometimes violent. I lived in an apartment building next to where he lived, and uh, I remember one night there was this big kerfuffle in his apartment, this noise and crashing and sound, and the police were called. He'd had somebody over for dinner, and during the course of the dinner, they'd started breaking up the apartment, and so the police took them off to jail. So that was Paul. I mean, he was uh, volatile and, and crazy always. A few years after Lind moved to Los Angeles, his life did appear to be settling down. He bought a house that was formerly owned by Errol Flynn and spent a small fortune renovating and decorating it. He was, however, quite neurotic about protecting it when friends came to visit. Paul had gorgeous taste, stunning taste in his decorating. Everything was perfect. And I remember taking an ashtray from one table to another don't touch it. <laughs> I said, okay. Paul's most public and by all accounts most successful relationship was with his dog, Harry McAfee, who was named after Paul's character in Bye Bye Birdie. He adored his dog and brought him everywhere. The rest of his love life, however, remained extremely private. Everyone in Hollywood knew that Paul was gay, but no one ever talked about it. It wasn't spoken of as much in those days. People didn't go around saying, hello, I'm gay. You know, I'm Spartacus. It wasn't any of that. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I think everybody knew. And, and if they didn't know just to meet him, once they, they sussed his living situation, you know, they knew. I mean, there was always some you know, cute guy named Chad standing around holding a martini glass. The only very public hint of Paul's backstage life occurred in 1965 when a young actor named Jim Davidson, who was staying with Paul in a hotel in San Francisco, fell to his death from the ledge of the hotel window, reportedly trying to impress Paul with a trick. What he was doing is um, he crawled out the window and then hung from the sill and tried to pull himself up, and he couldn't. And uh, Paul tried to help him, but he slept. The fact that it was with Paul was enough for most people to believe that he could have been pushed, <laughs> which says a lot about how people felt about Paul and how they themselves had been treated by him. So you never really wanted to be too near an open window when you were dealing with him. By the mid-60s, Paul was enjoying great success as a guest star on many television shows. But he had dreams of becoming something more. He wanted to be the star of his own series. To that end, Lind made four different sitcom pilots. None of them made it to air. Paul felt that one of them, a Victorian detective spoof, was some of his best work. A puzzle is a puzzle, Major Dobbs, be it the theft of the Magna Carta or a piece of string. Duplicate this if you can, a perfect triple trapezoid. <laughs> ABC did pick up the Sedgwick pilot, but after Jim Davidson's death and the surrounding gossip, they were too scared to put it on the air. ABC was worried about it. They were worried about Paul and what he might do. Paul was bitterly disappointed, but he soon had plenty to occupy his time. In 1966, he made his first appearance on a new television game show. It was called Hollywood Squares. He was so good in it, he became the permanent center square. It turned out to be the longest lasting role of his life. And even though he didn't write his own material, the format was perfectly suited to his humor. Queen Elizabeth generally swings her umbrella behind her back. And immediately something happens. What? Uh, Lord Snowden doubles up in pain. <laughs> <laughs> According to Fred Astaire, his mother wanted him to do it when he was 35. But he refused, and he still hasn't done it. Done what? Moved out of the house. <laughs> it was a wit. It was one line, a zinger. 
It was one thing that uh, summed up the situation. Twiggy reportedly added an inch to her bust line while making the boyfriend. What does that make her bust measurement now? One. <laughs> that was the, the whole comic thing was, I'm now going to tell you the truth in one line. And you can't fight me. And I think that people responded to that. Responded in droves, in fact. Lynn's outrageous wit attracted an army of fans and contributed to making Hollywood Squares one of the most popular and long-running game shows in television history. Paul would stay on the show for 15 years. A great, great amount of the success of the show was due to his participation. I mean, people looked forward to him. They loved him. They would quote his jokes the day after, the week after. You know, he received more love letters than anybody. I was pretty cute in those days. <laughs> he got many more love letters than I did. People were mad for him. Ironically, Paul's biggest fans were women, middle America housewives who never seemed to notice that Lind was a homosexual. To them, he was much like Liberace, just lovably eccentric and flamboyant, even when his humor had undeniably gay and kinky overtones. I would say, Paul, uh, why do motorcyclists wear leather and he says because you find wrinkles five hundred dollars in a tie game the great writer george bernard shaw once wrote it's such a wonderful thing what a crime to waste it on children what is it a whipping <laughs> paul achieved enormous visibility and popularity through hollywood squares he was finally rich and famous but it wouldn't be long before he viewed the center square as a prison by the time Paul Lind entered the 70s and his 40s, he was logging over 180 hours on television each year. He had, to all appearances, achieved his dream of wealth and fame. But it didn't seem to make him happy or calm him down. We all thought that, that Paul's demons were something that success would cure. And once he got the house and the money and the fame, that that would make him nice. But it didn't. He only got more volatile and more complicated as time went on. For one thing, success never eliminated his insecurity. The fat boy from Ohio still felt like the fat boy from Ohio. He never knew how talented he was. He never knew how handsome he was. He never knew how sexy he was. And he was all those things. But I felt bad because he never really acknowledged it about himself, you know. Paul even questioned how funny he was. In the early nightclub days, if only because of poverty, he had written all his own sketches and monologues. Now he required a writer wherever he went, and that included his zingers on Hollywood Squares. True or false? Some airlines now give you a thorough frisking before permitting you to board the plane. Oh, that's the only reason I fly. <laughs> all his material was written for him. All his material was written for him. So one of the amazing things about Paul was that he was an amazingly funny guy, a terrifically witty guy, but he had no confidence in himself. He really didn't realize how funny he was. Paul was also sick of playing the center square on Hollywood squares. He wanted to be a movie star, but Hollywood, he said, didn't see him as anyone but that man in the box, and he felt trapped. I think we all feel that way. I felt trapped also. I, I'm a musical comedy performer, and all of a sudden I'm a game show host. Uh, he was a, uh, he's, he's done theater, he's done a thing, and all of a sudden he's on a game show. And it, it, it's not a good, it has a stigma to it. He was making a fortune, and he was a hugely popular, recognizable personality, but he was not the center of anything except Hollywood Squares, and I think he felt that was a cheap thing to be the center of. Paul did have some opportunities to break out of the box. In 1972, he starred in his own sitcom, The Paul Lind Show. Martha, sex is not for housewives. I've noticed that lately. This time, he played an uptight attorney and father who has to battle a liberal-minded son-in-law. And once again, the character was quintessential Paul Lind. I'll tell you what you've just done. <laughs> In less than a minute, 
all by yourself. <laughs> you cost me a bonus that J.J. is in his office signing at this moment. You stole that from under my nose. <laughs> Oh! Never creep up on daddy like that when he's medicated. The show only lasted one season. Although the ratings weren't bad, they weren't great either, and the network decided not to renew it. It's, it's like chocolate mousse. You, you like a taste of it, but you can't have it for the whole meal. Um, He's a second banana. He was not the star. Paul's failure as a leading man may have contributed to the biggest problem he had, drinking, which was becoming ever more public during the 70s. In 1974, he was arrested in Ohio after yelling obscenities at a patrol officer. In 1978, he was arrested in Salt Lake City for public intoxication. He was picked up for drunk driving on numerous occasions. And that wasn't all. This one evening he went out to a big, huge gay bar in Columbus, Ohio. And he got exceedingly drunk. And he was dancing on the dance floor. And some one came over and insulted him terribly. He just put a cigarette out on the person's cheek. That was shocking. I think he was very, very sorry after that. Friends began to withdraw from Paul. Even those who considered themselves close friends felt that it was just too difficult and hurtful to be around him when he drank. He'd say to me, you're never going to get anywhere. You're too overweight. And I thought, well, I don't need this. Every time he comes over and has dinner, he gets drunk. He burned the carpet one day. And I thought, well, hey, I'm not making your kind of money. Don't burn my carpet. So, you know, I couldn't, um, I didn't want to take any more abuse from him. But he was a very exceptional person. I don't think anybody ever stopped loving Paul, even anyone who might have been attacked by him. You just loved him. You just, he, people were passionate about him. He evoked great loyalty and, and, and sorrow if he, if he did something that was horrible. Paul no longer made much of an effort to disguise the fact that he was gay. Although he never officially came out of the closet, he came pretty close. An interviewer once asked him in the late 70s, uh, why he wasn't married, and he said, what, do you live in a cave? Paul's romantic attachments were problematic, however. He spent a lot of nights cruising gay bars, both in Los Angeles and on the road. He had many boyfriends, but he never seemed to hang on to them for very long. Oh, I met several nice fellows. The important one was Pablo, the artist from Brooklyn, and spoke Spanish, n knew very little English, and had no idea who Paul was. He was a lovely man. By the time the end of the 70s rolled around, Paul was very rich and very well known. He was also chronically unhappy and lonely. It was time, way past time, for a fresh start. By the end of the 70s, Paul Lind was in his 50s and heartily bored with Hollywood Squares. Even though he had no other work lined up, he decided to leave the show. He left halfway through the season and he had no offers whatsoever. And the producers realized that the ratings just dropped like unbelievably and they said, we have to get him back somehow. They finally made a deal with him and he got more money and deservedly so. He should have gotten more money, he came back. When he returned to the squares, Paul shared co-star billing with Peter Marshall. The show was now in syndication, and it lasted another year. And in 1979, Paul made what would be his final appearance in a movie. He played the role of Chief Nervous Elk in The Villain. What's in it for? Nervous Elk. Scalps. Sc scalps? Come now, many sticker Johns. Cactus Jack, Cactus Jack Slade. What is <laughs> Once again, Paul Lind was playing Paul Lind. Paul was now living in a new home. His beloved dog, Harry McAfee, died in 1977. Paul couldn't stand to live in the Errol Flynn house without him, so he bought a house in Beverly Hills. 
Once again, he spent a lot of time fixing it up, and once again, he was weirdly protective. He had a big open house party, and he wouldn't let us in the house. We ate outside. I don't want anything messed up. I said, are you crazy? But he was eccentric. Let's just say he was eccentric. And I adored him. I really did. But much more significant changes were happening in Paul's life. He was finally fed up with his offstage activities. After years of boozing, he decided to clean up his act. He decided to give up alcohol. He had become completely sober. And I think he beat me to it by a, by a bit. And he would call me up to see how I was doing. And, and he would tell me how good it felt and how alive and well and alert he felt. In 1981, Hollywood Squares ended its 15-year run, and Paul started to think about what to do next. He was considering a move back to New York when he took a small part in a hidden camera comedy show. One morning, the producer and crew came to pick him up for a shoot. It was midday, and the newspaper was in the driveway, and my first reaction was, Oh, man, he's not home. He never came home last night. He's out playing or doing something, and he's screwing me. And uh, later that, uh, that evening, I heard from the Beverly Hills police, who, you know, he had been discovered. He was home all right, but he was dead. Paul had died in bed of a massive heart attack. He was only 55 years old. I met his doctor a week after Paul had died, and uh, Dr. Packard said, that with the autopsy, Paul had a heart of an 85-year-old man. And that was that story. But because it was Paul Lind, Hollywood was rife with sordid tales of a male hustler at his deathbed, poppers and drugs littering the bed. None of these stories appear to be true. What was true was that before his death, Paul Lind had finally turned his life around. It made me so sad because he was just beginning to live a life where he got up feeling good in the morning and looking forward to the day, and then he died. He was just a very talented man. He was a man who will always be remembered as a comedy genius. I'd like if you'd all like to hear this poem that he wrote that I think is one of his funniest. The title is Trouble in the Tulip Bed. I don't know what to say. A tulip talked to me today. I was trimming the hedge quite near the mountain ledge. When quite near the mountain behold. ledge. When lo and behold, my blood ran cold. Yes, a tulip screamed at me today. <laughs> It was my favorite, the one I called Blanche. <laughs> she puckered up her petals and screamed, Avalanche! <laughs> yes, a tulip saved my life today. Now, you may not think this quite so much, but you see... But you see, most tulips speak Dutch.